So, hi everybody. Um, as you can see, I deal in bodies. I'm a cartoonist. It's my bread and butter. So I want to talk about bodies today, my own and by extension your body. You know, we all have some sort of relationship with our bodies. I know I started drawing bodies when I was a little girl <laughs> to try to understand my own body, but also to understand the bodies around me. Because a lot of us have issues with our bodies. We're either too tall, too short, too fat, too thin. You know, um, I know I had my share of issues with bodies, with my own body. But I'm not going to talk about that today. What I want to talk about is the social and political implications of the woman's body. Now, <laughs> now our bodies take us through life. You know, they're, they're with us every step of the way. You know, they're with us when we go to, to school for the first time. They're with us when we first encounter Barbie. <laughs> they're with us when we graduate from high school or college. They're with us when we um, go for our first job interview. <laughs> our first apartment. Our first promotion. <laughs> our first marriage. Our second marriage. Our third marriage. <laughs> and our divorce, if we have one. <laughs> so, so our bodies are with us all the time on all the major milestones. I was, I was uh, waiting for the train the other day. And um, this woman walked by with a little girl, hand in hand, and the little girl said something to the woman, and I couldn't quite hear her, but I heard the woman respond to her, and she said, oh, you had, your, you had another hiccup. And the little girl nodded. She was about five. She nodded. And you could see the look of anticipation and excitement in her face, you know, for the next hiccup. This was a big day for her. She was going to share this with anybody who would listen. It was as if her body was doing something on its own, without her consent, and she was being witness. And it got me to thinking, our bodies have a life of their own also, I think. And I thought, what if you asked your body about its major milestones? I think you might get a different list than what I just gave you. So I, I asked my body. We're now on speaking terms. <laughs> um, I asked my body about the major events. And the first thing that it told me about, and I remember this very clearly, was my period. As luck would have it, mine came on a school day. And I thought, OK, I'm going to stay home from school. No problem. No. Nope. <laughs> My mother said, you have to go to school. This is a normal part of life. Your body's going to do this every 28 days, so you better get used to it. So like a good girl, I trudged off to work. <laughs> and I, you know, I did all the things I was supposed to do, you know, even sports. And by the end of the day, I felt like I'd conquered the world. Why? Because I dealt with something that was really kind of weird and icky, and I had a new relationship with my body, and I'd kept it secret from everybody around me. Well, the next thing my body and I talked about was breasts. <laughs> <laughs> my body is very, very proud of this accomplishment. <laughs> me, not so much. <laughs> I went out and I tried to find bras that would minimize my breasts. For me, that's not too difficult. <laughs> but um, you know, I really, here was something that was happening to me that was announcing to the world that I was a woman. And I just wasn't ready for it. <laughs> I'm still really not ready for it, but that's, that's the way it goes. Um, the next thing we talked about, my body and I, was sex, my first intimate encounter. Um, which was a good one. I, you know, I had a boyfriend in high school, and we planned this very carefully. And I snuck up into his parent, into his room, at his parents' house. And um, even though my body said it was a significant event, for me, it was a non-event. <laughs> my mind made it more of an event than I think it really, really was. Um, so anyway, we we dated for a few more months, this young man and I. And I went out and I bought a book to help me understand my body. And I also really thought I was going to give it to him to let him know <laughs> what I wanted. And he was, he was kind of annoyed. Um, why 
well, why was I giving a book? Why couldn't I tell him what I wanted? <laughs> I think you all can relate to this one. Um, my body and my mind and my mouth were not willing to collaborate. <laughs> the next thing we talked about was hair. My body and I um, discussed the first time that I remember I had a, a haircut. Um, when I was growing up, I had really long blonde hair. Um, and I had it for a couple reasons. First of all, it was the early 70s, and it was you know, not, not, not unnormal to have long hair, um, post-hippie time. And, but, but the main reason why I think I had long blonde hair was because it covered my body. <laughs> it also was my nod to femininity. You know, I didn't, you know, I, it was my nod to that, that nonverbal dance that we do with the other sex. Um, you know, I didn't have to do anything with my body. I had my hair. So um, it came a point in my early 20s when I realized I really probably should cut it. Um, so I found a hair salon in New York City and it was terrifying. Not only did I not know the lingo <laughs> or the etiquette of a hair salon, I was getting rid of my best friend and exposing my body. Well, many years passed and I got married and I got pregnant and we talked, my body and I talked about this. And pregnancy is something that sort of uh, puts you really off balance. Uh, not, not just, you know, you know, having to walk down the street, but also it, it, it <laughs> adjusts your equal, I mean, it adjusts your equilibrium because your, your, your mind and your body are, are off balance with the rest of, you know, with the world around you. It's a whole new phase for your body. <laughs> and then, um, of course, birth. You know how incredibly painful this is. It's incredibly painful. However, more difficult for me was the weight, the emotional weight of having to bring another human being, or wanting to bring, or <laughs> intending to bring another human being <laughs> into the world, and the, the long-term consequences of that. And I have daughters, so when my first daughter was born, I felt so much of a burden with, with giving birth to a daughter, you know, the stereotypes of the mother and daughter. You know, was I now supposed to teach her about makeup? <laughs> about, about clothes? How to do her body in this culture? Did I have to now embrace pink? You know, was I supposed to do, teach somebody else all this now? Then the final hurrah, menopause. We talked about this a long time because it's really confusing for those of us who've been through it. You know, there's many, many symptoms. You don't really know when it's going to start, and you don't know when it's going to end, and you don't know which <laughs> symptoms are what, and you know, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> and the other thing is that it's sort of the nail. <laughs> it's trying to sort of the nail in the coffin of your sexual allure. You are, your gender role is now sort of diminished, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a shock. For many of us, myself included, it's actually freeing. So our bodies are really busy working for us. But we all know that they're also busy being appropriated and consumed by the culture. If you have a relationship with your body, it usually involves a third party, society. You know that, um, oops, back up. Um, I can remember in, in uh, many days, I would be walking down the street and construction workers would tell me how I, how I was, <laughs> what I looked like. I lived. <laughs> I lived in Italy when I was 16 with my family. And uh, can you imagine 16, Italy, long blonde hair? It was like a crash course in all of this. Um, I remember being pinched on buses 
and looked at in ways I had no clue what was going on, being approached in inappropriate ways. Um, I learned that year what I have, I have learned for the rest of my life over the, over the years is that my body meant something else to others around me. So as I was saying before, we know that multi-million dollar industries are based on this. The cosmetic industry, <laughs> the entertainment industry, <laughs> the fashion industry, <laughs> and some women's magazines. You know, we've, we've lost confidence. <laughs> we've lost confidence in our bodies and ourselves, and we, and we rely on others to tell us who we are. <laughs> you know, we think we know what we do, we're doing, but, but do we really? So all these things I've been talking about have to do with sexuality and reproduction. But what about other events in your life that are, that are deeply qualified by the fact a woman's body is experiencing it? Now, I'm going to show you a couple cartoons that were published in The New Yorker that I did over the years and talk about this. And what I'm going to show you first is the, the image, and then I'll give you the caption, because I want you to focus on the, on the image. Um, now, this one was done in 1994. And if you look at the three people on the couch, you'll see the women are, have their arms crossed and their legs crossed, except for the woman with her hand up. And the man is sitting there with his legs spread, and yes, his arms are crossed, but he's sitting as if he owns that space. In fact, he may own the whole room. Um, I did this instinctively. I didn't consciously do this. I, was just, I just draw what I observe in my mind's eye, because the caption has nothing to do with, with what I'm talking about. Now, the next one um, was done in 2008. And this cartoon, you'll see the women are doing the same thing. They, their arms are crossed and their legs are crossed. But that's not what I want to talk about here. Um, when you look at this cartoon, you're probably thinking, oh, it's a cartoon about women's issues, because there's two women talking, right? Well, you, you'd be wrong. I consciously chose to put two women in this cartoon as the characters in the cartoon to buck that stereotype as every, every man as a man. You know, women can be every man. Because again, the cartoon has nothing to do with women's issues. <laughs> now the final one is a little more complicated. It's a scene, I did this in 1996, and it's a scene uh, that we know happening all over the country and, and the world, and it's a domestic scene, and the mother's doing, or the woman's doing what she's supposed to do, the father's doing what he's supposed to do, and a little girl's doing what she's supposed to do. So you think you have these people figured out. But when you look at the caption, you'll see that it, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> the, the woman is a feminist. She's cooking dinner, but she's a feminist. Little girl is challenging the word feminism. She's trying to understand it. She's, she doesn't get it. But she's also going to learn soon that probably the behavior that she's suggesting is not appropriate for a little girl. So we're always trying to adjust, or we're always adjusting our bodies in any given social situation or any situation. We, we make our bodies small, not taking up much space, uh, not, you know, we make them to be unthreatening, uh, attractive, and submissive. And it took me a long time to realize this, and I just rec recently realized it really, is that we need to believe in our presence and that wherever there is, we're supposed to be there. Now, this is something that's a problem around the world. In the United States, we can deal with it. It's something that we have to work with and work on. Um, but in other countries, as you know, it's a life or death situation. Women are being detained for driving a car, being beaten or stoned to death for wearing the wrong thing, being in the wrong place, talking to the wrong person, or moving their body in the wrong way. 
I mean, recently I, I heard on the news about an Egyptian woman, I'm sorry, an, an Afghan woman, who was given the choice of jail or marrying her rapist. Those are her choices. And she chose to marry her rapist for the sake of her daughter. So, you know, women are doing, as we've learned in this conference, amazing things around the globe. But it's time to free our bodies. Now, we're all leaders in this room. And we all got here. <laughs> we all got here by saying things that we weren't supposed to say, doing things that we weren't supposed to do, being in places we weren't supposed to be. I think it's our job to educate young women sooner so they understand these things sooner. You know, that little girl with the hiccup, she's going to go on to have a relationship with her body, but she'll lose confidence in her body, and she'll lose confidence in herself. And then she'll lose any kind of amazement she has in the world and other things. We have to help each generation because each generation is at risk. <laughs> so all these things I've been talking about are, um, some of them are obvious, some of them are, are more subtle. But we all know them, and we, you know, we know them instinctively um, because we live them every day, every minute of every day, you know, at home, in the workplace, on the street. You know, all women, we're all different too, but we all have in common pretty much the same body. And it's time to do something about this. Um, you know, Virginia Woolf famously said almost a decade ago that um, we need a room of our own to be creative. Well, I think we have a room of our own in our minds. And it's time to take our amazing brains and do whatever we can, and in my case, draw, to help ourselves and help others liberate our bodies so that we may truly dance. Thank you. <laughs>